This is the Art of Network Engineering podcast. In this podcast, we'll explore tools, technologies, and talented people. We aim to bring you information that will expand your skill sets and toolbox and share the stories of fellow network engineers. Welcome to the Art of Network Engineering. I am AJ Murray at No Blinky Blinky. And tonight I am joined by Lexi at Track It Pacer. Lexi, how are you? Hey, AJ. I'm good. I'm very tired. I've been awake since four yes, in the morning. Big, big day, big day. <laughs> it was a big day at work. We, uh, we launched a rocket and um, <laughs> there were a bunch of people on it. And I don't know who most of them are. <laughs> But uh, one of them was a was an employee of ours, and so it was really nice. Oh and, wow! Yeah, Very he cool. uh, he architected the the rocket itself, and so it was really nice to see him go up. But it was a very early launch, and I'm very tired. So forgive me in advance for anything dumb that I say. <laughs> Four a.m. is that. very very early. Yeah, I'm gonna crash tonight. How are you, AJ? So. I, I'm excited because uh, as we record this episode in one week's time, we will all be together in Asheville. Uh, very exciting. Uh, the first time ever, all of us will be in the same room under one roof uh, since we started this thing. And I'm also really excited because I'm holding a track at Pacer sticker. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, we, we got a whole bunch of stickers ordered for the show next weekend. So if you're attending, you will have uh, stickers for every co-host on the show, including stickers for the Art of Network Engineering. I even made a sticker for Dan. Dear old Dan got his own face on a sticker. If you're just listening <laughs> so to the you podcast. you can have a limited it's, edition Howdy Packet sticker on your laptop. It's literally a picture of Dan's face <laughs> on like the light blue background. He's giving that like... That like stern dad look that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's Dan in a nutshell. I love it. I can't make a logo, but I can make a sticker with a picture. Is there any text on that with sticker, or is it literally uh, just it, his it, face? You can probably barely see it, but it does have his Twitter handle like up in okay, the, the corner nice. on the edge. Nice. So, in case you needed to follow Dan, and you need to follow Dan because <laughs> I think he has like a hundred followers on Twitter. So. Awesome. Well, uh, we'll cut to some wins, and when we come back, we'll introduce our guest. And now it's time for some wins. This week, winning in our Discord channel is Bill Murray. He accepted a new position as a senior manager for IT operations. Congratulations, Bill. Pet Frong got a huge salary bump. Congratulations. Mind Shadow accepted a new job as a network engineer at a large corporation. The Complete Noob accepted a new role as a network engineer as well. Lots of new jobs this week. Congratulations, everybody. ELI GRP passed the AWS Cloud Practitioner. Congratulations. New Patreons this week. There are no new Patreons joining us this week, but if you're interested in joining the Patreon program, you can go to patreon.com forward slash art of net eng. Check out our different tiers and uh, join the program that suits you best. And uh, you'll see all the cool stuff we have going on. Thank you so much for your support of what we do here at the Art of Network Engineering podcast. Now back to the show. All right. And this week, I am uh, very excited to welcome to the show uh, She Networks, uh, otherwise known as Serena. Serena, thank you so much for joining us this week. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, you are pretty big on TikTok. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll start and, with and that. Twitter and, and other and other social media uh, outlets. <laughs> um, so I, I want to start with that. Like, you, you know, you're your network engineer. What what was the motivation and, and why did you decide to start a TikTok and, and do all the videos and stuff that you do? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I I'm not really like a content creator. I guess I am now, but before TikTok, I really wasn't. Um, and I had a pretty small social media following. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of like average. I didn't really use Twitter at all. I didn't use TikTok aside from watching videos. But I had downloaded TikTok during quarantine, you know, when everything kind of picked up and everyone was bored in the house. And mm -hmm. I started to eventually the TikTok algorithm kind of puts content in front of your face that it thinks you will like. And I've 
I stumbled upon Tech Talk, which is the um, technical creators on TikTok. And at the time, it was very small. There was only really a few people doing it. And when I had found them, I was like, wow, this is crazy because I didn't I didn't really realize that people on TikTok would be interested in anything technical, right? right. But I was very wrong. There <laughs> is a huge community now and a, a ton of content creators sure. for TikTok. And, you know, I just started posting videos based on trends. So TikTok always has really popular trends. And I would try and figure out a way to either make them technical related or networking related. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I started to do more in-depth technical videos and see what I could really accomplish in 60 seconds, right? What can I teach someone or talk about or convey in 60 seconds that for the majority of the time it's networking related, but I do do some like general networking or general technology stuff as well. Very you cool. have a background cool. in networking, is that right? Correct. You, yeah. you are a network engineer like currently? Um, so I'm currently unemployed. Okay. Your last, your <laughs> last position, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I've actually worked at Cisco for the last few years. Oh, okay, um, cool. so I graduated college and, um, my first job out of college was working in tech. At wow. Cisco. Nice. Very nice. cool. Very yeah, cool. And that was wild. Cause I, so the team that I was working on was server virtualization. So I was taking cases based off of UCS or Intersight. Um, I think like 1000 V sometimes, mm, <laughs> although yep, I would try yep. and avoid those cases. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I started at Cisco, I had never even heard of UCS. And then three months later I was taking cases on it. So it was wild because my background had at that point been on in more CCNA level courses, some CCMP, but all of it was enterprise catalyst type stuff. So I was like, I really don't know much about servers or VMware. And I had taken a Linux class before, but I, you know, I didn't have any production experience in any of those things. And then all of a sudden I'm taking these cases where, um, you know, the customer might have been working on UCS for years and I'm on like just graduated <laughs> college and I'm just like crap how did you were you just like thrown to the wolves or how did you end up learning so quickly to deal with those cases tack is brutal <laughs> tack is no. very brutal and like um you know part of it is being thrown to the wolves because now I think that's why I work really well under pressure is because of that experience and yeah. So you do some training, right? But you're not going to get any better training than hands-on experience. So typically you're going to maybe shadow a little bit, um, but you're going to also take some lower priority cases, learn how to use a lot of the tools. A big part of TAC is log analysis. Like I spent almost the majority of my time going through logs. Um, for, you know, like root cause analysis is a big thing. Like, why did this server restart or why did this part fail or, you know, just different things like that. Just a lot of log analysis, finding bugs. So, yeah, I mean, it, it took a while, right? You start off a little bit slower, but then at some point, you know, you get when you're a full fledged hack engineer, they put you on a queue and every team kind of does it a little bit different. But my team was like, you, if a case gets sent to you, that's your case. And it doesn't matter if you've taken a case like that before, you're going to have to figure it out. And that's what I oh did. God. And, you know, <laughs> I would get cases where it'd be like a hospital system down. I had oh, a case wow. once where it was a oh 911 system down for like a major city and a state. And that was on me. And I was like Holy 22. Shit. And I'm like, How? okay. And, you know, I figured Ooh. it out though. You do have so many resources when you're working in tech. And, you know, the first thing that I would do if I didn't know what I was looking at would be to like look up cases that had similar issues um, and then just kind of go from there. So do you have documentation? Like if you can talk about this, I don't know if you can share it about tech, but like, do y'all have some kind of ticketing system documentation where you can look at what past engineers have troubleshot and how they went by through it step by step, what they learned, things like that. Yeah. So here's how it typically goes, right? So I was, 
I don't, I guess it would be like layer three, four, level three, four engineer. So we have what's called a GDP team. And those are usually, and this is come from, coming from a, a UCS perspective, virtual server virtualization. Some teams operate a little bit differently depending on the technology. Um, but so the GDP teams are usually taking cases on hardware for the most part, or like quick, easy solves, things like that. The team that I was on was handling the much more complex cases. So I was kind of almost the final engineer that you would get, um, unless we'd have to escalate it to the BU, but I would still be your engineer at that point. I'd just be involving the BU, um, but yeah, so if if I didn't know, basically I would look for other cases using search terms like internally to find if there was a similar case. Good. And if there wasn't, then I would start looking up that error and going from there. Sometimes you'd have to go through tech engineers old cases and depending on how great they were at documentation. I mean, you could find a case where it's like, oh, they solved the issue, but they didn't document how they did it. So oh, I'm out of luck. <laughs> You know, and and most of the time I would say people are pretty good about it. Um, But, you know, you do run into those those issues occasionally. And then if you if I didn't know, I'd maybe ask someone on my team or just kind of like talk to the person the next cube over and be like, hey, like, have you seen this before? And then I would ask maybe my technical lead. If they didn't know, we could basically like pulse out to all the engineers within our technology basically write up a really good summary of what's happening, log messages, errors, everything you've tried. And then all the engineers that are in your technology around the world are able to reply and answer to that, basically. I love that. If you, this little group thing. Yeah. So it's it's encouraged or like it's not discouraged, I guess, to like ask for help from other engineers when you need it or like pool resources on a case that's really complicated or difficult. Yeah. TAC would not function without those resources, basically. I mean, you would never solve cases <laughs> if you couldn't <laughs> ask other people for help because it's impossible to know everything that's going to go wrong, right? And sometimes you're going to run into a weird bug and I'm not a developer, so I can go through logs and be like, hey, I got this weird error message. But at the end of the day, I didn't write the code. So I don't really know where that bug came from or how to fix it, right? And sometimes I can be like, oh, this is a documented bug and they fix it in this version, right? Then that's that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the most common thing that I would see would be like um, interoperability problems where people would update but not update drivers. So, uh, you know, you'd have those issues where it's like, well, your systems are all messed up because you're operating on these drivers on this like firmware version and it's not communicating properly or there's a bug in this firmware version. So you need to go to the next one. I mean, you run into those problems all the time, but again, it's tax. So I'm not running into not problem. (laughs) No one's opening a case being like, Hey, I'm having a great time. Love it. (laughs) It's just issues every day. I would get like four or five cases. Wouldn't that be so nice though? If everyone was like, Hey, just wanted to say thank you. TAC engineers. That's all my ticket is. Just wanted to open it. Say <laughs> I thanks. love this router so much. I just wanted to <laughs> let you guys know this product. is thing. It's like working flawlessly. Yeah, we don't get those conversations. <laughs> so you, everyone in tech kind of starts bright eyed and bushy tailed. And then towards like the end of your first year, you're grumpy because you're just like, <laughs> this is, it can get rough. Like burnout oh, yeah. is super common for tech engineers because I mean, there was a, a two or three month period where I had a sev one every single day. Oh and my so, gosh. And when you're on a sev one, you're still taking cases in the background. So cases are still coming in your queue. And oh, so no I would way. be on a sev and then taking like two or three cases that were like maybe a P3, right? And from there, I'd be like, okay, so I'm like sending my initial emails out to these other cases to meet the SLAs, which typically sometimes wasn't too difficult to multitask because like, you know, there's so much waiting when you're trying to troubleshoot. It's like, oh, we'll try this thing. We'll see, we'll give it a minute or it takes, Mm. you know, whatever. So there's a lot of waiting. So sometimes it's not too difficult. But yeah, I mean, it would get crazy. And so you'd have a a backlog of cases you're trying to get to, but I'm on a sev every single day. And so by the end of that, I was just like, I was done. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I would be too. I can't imagine that. I remember being at a, um, 
a, a job in my past I won't name, but sometimes we like, we kept tech engineers on for like, you know, through their entire shift, it would not end. And then we take the next one on the next shift and it wouldn't end with the sev whatever, right? So I can't even imagine like, <laughs> I know there's a lot of like hurry up and wait in those, but I, I, I can't imagine being that tech engineer and having to like concentrate on other things even for a little bit when you're in the middle of an emergency, even if you are waiting, like you still have to keep it straight in your head. I don't know. That's that's wild. The other thing that happens, so what would happen, you'd get a SEV1, right? So you get a SEV1, the customer is already on the phone. So whoever is in the front lines, like sends you the call, they do the handoff. And then sometimes once you pick up that case, the account team will add you to a chat, like an internal chat where it's like all the account team, like sales engineers, whoever, because they're talking about it too, trying to get it fixed and like seeing what they can do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the account manager will be like, just replace the part, just replace the part. I'm like, I'm going to send a part out and it's not going to fix your issue because it's not a part <laughs> problem. So it's like all the time and they always just want you to like replace a part, like send an M- R- RMA. And I'm like, this, like, this isn't a dim failure. <laughs> like, this is much further past that Sounds familiar. at this point. So yeah. you, you knew if you got added to a chat, like it was going to be a rough call. <laughs> so yeah. That, yeah. Uh-huh. So you have like account teams, H Tom's other cases happening. Um, if it is a critical infrastructure, like a hospital, 911, anything like that, um, that gets escalated to, I think it's like directors or something. And, and the longer that you're on that call, the longer that your severity case doesn't resolve, your it, it gets escalated so it's like automatic it's like okay so now the director gets emailed and now like the vp gets emailed because oh you haven't gosh. resolved your case yet and it hasn't gone down in severity and so it and then you have to like you're emailing updates being like no we're working on it it's fine like whatever so it's a ton of multitasking it's a lot of stress but i would do it again for sure like oh, i think yeah. it was a great part okay. of my career So it was a good place to learn ultimately for you. It sounds like you grew a lot. Oh, yeah. I would definitely not be where I am now without my experience in tech. Like I it was very valuable as far as learning goes. Um, And I would I would do it again. I would recommend other people would do it again. But I would not recommend that you stay there for longer than two years. Why is that for me? The problem with tech is, well, there's a couple problems. One, it's pay. In my opinion, I think a lot of tech engineers are underpaid, which is unfortunate because we would joke, like, this is probably bad, but I don't work there anymore, so whatever. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, like, we would joke that, like, oh, we're getting paid this much. And you're like, oh, you know the person that we're we're helping out on the other side of the lines making triple what we we make right (laughs) and so we would joke about that (laughs) and like it's probably not great but it was true like it was true that the uh, being everyone knew being on the other end is where more money was gonna be um but also when you're in tech and one technology for a very long time you end up getting very siloed Mm. so Mm -hmm. all i would know would be the technologies that i worked on and of course you know ucs goes into um a lot of times SAN. so i knew a lot about a lot of storage systems and SAN switches like brocade we would go into like nexus um and then so I would learn a little bit about Nexus and how all that went together or ACI. But if you're trying to get a good round, rounded experience as a network engineer, that's not going to be at TAC. You're going to mm. learn UCS, like the back of your palm. You're going to be able to solve all these problems. And in some companies, like bigger companies where it's like, yeah, we want just a UCS engineer. That's great. Yeah. But not everywhere is like that. The majority right. of places aren't like that. So you're not going to have a really rounded knowledge base or experience with the other technologies that you need as a network engineer, like firewalls and mm-hmm. um, load balancers and different things like that. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So you said this we, was we've... your. Sorry. No, no, so you said ahead. this Sorry. was your first. Um, this was your first position out of college. Yeah. So straight out of college. Yeah. So- Yeah, I had an offer from Cisco a year before I graduated college. 
Wow. Um, and so it was part of their like new college grad hiring program. And so I went to, I moved from, so I went to University of Akron because they had a CCNA Academy or Cisco Academy there. And then from there, I drove to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I stayed for three months and was on that campus doing their like new grad program. And the idea is you're going to go there, you're going to get a CCNA, learn how to be a tech engineer, yada, yada. I got my CCNA in two weeks because my oh. undergrad was all Cisco stuff, right? Oh, so I didn't, okay. I right. didn't really need to do that much studying for it. Um, I just basically did some practice tests and then went and took like the ICND one and then ICND two. Um, but you know, there's other people that get hired that like have a background in electrical engineering. Not everybody that got hired came from a Cisco Academy. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my advantage. So I ended up helping other people with their CCNAs and then playing like a lot of foosball basically <laughs> when I was in RTP. Um, and then from there I went to the Richardson office where the CCIE lab is. Uh, and yeah, that was my first job out of college. <laughs> wow. So it, did you obtain any other certifications other than the CCNA? Yeah. So I ended up doing the CCNA routing and switching. Mm -hmm. Then I went and got the data center one because oh, cool. like kind of right before it expired. Cause like I already know all the UCS stuff. I know a ton of the Nexus stuff, mm -hmm. a lot of the SAN stuff. Mm -hmm. So, or storage, you know, like I was like, I might as well just go take the certification. So I studied a little bit for that one. I ended up getting that one. Um, I got like my AWS certification. Um, I have my DevNet uh, network plus. And then for TikTok, I did, uh, getting the security plus in 24 hours. <laughs> that oh, was great. In 24 hours. Yeah, wow. I love that. Yeah, I, so I wanted to see, well, it was like good TikTok content and I didn't have to pay for the certification. So I was like, Hey, like based off of what I know right now, can I get the security plus in 24 hours because I gave my boss was paying for this the cert, the certification and I didn't want to like fail it and then him be like so how did you study and then you'd be like I didn't <laughs> <laughs> so I basically was like all right I'll give myself 24 hours so I don't completely just like YOLO this three hundred dollar <laughs> voucher that I have um and you know so I mainly focus on the cryptography section because that I was doing like some practice tests and that's what I was scoring consistently the lowest on. So I basically spent the entire 24 hours focusing on that section. I went and took it and I passed it. So like, yay. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Did you study just um, like out of a book? You just said you took practice tests. I had special? like Udemy business mm -hmm. so I could like get all the courses that I wanted. So I think I used Jason Dion's practice test and that was, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that I used. I think I, I used a practice test and then looked at the topics that I was failing on from the practice test and then just went and looked up those topics basically. Okay. Smart. We, yeah. <laughs> we had a couple of questions come in uh, pertaining to your, your TAC time uh, or your time at TAC. Um, one of them was, did you ever get a customer that lied that uh, was trying to turn a P3 into a P1 just to get uh, faster assistance? And Yeah, I, I all mean, the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, I, all the time. <laughs> I, I have had to do that. I've been, I have been You didn't have to do that. I, I have don't, been I don't instructed to do that. Oh, today. okay. I'm all sorry. Right. <laughs> I think it... It really depends on the tech engineer that you get, how they're going to handle that. For me, I was always so busy that I was not putting up with any BS. So I basically <laughs> would be like, um, I mean, I would start them off, right? And maybe get them going in the right direction. But then you have to kind of explain like, hey, um, you know, because there's not an active outage going on, I'm going to lower this to a P3. If I had the time, I would try and help them, especially if it was like a quick fix while they're still on the call, but I would lower the ticket down to a P3 so that, because the longer it's at a P1, like I said, the ticket keeps escalating. And so mm -hmm. it'll send out emails to my manager, then the director and blah, 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 whatever. Um, and so you'd have to be explaining. But the other thing is when I'm on a, on queue, I can't be on a call unless it's, a, an outage. Mm -hmm. So if I get another case that comes in that is a outage, 
I have to take that and prioritize that over the P3 that I'm on if that yeah. one really isn't truly an outage because yeah. your coworkers are going to look at you and be like, why are you trying to get out of taking outage cases? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, everyone gets, those are can be stressful. And if you, so for the Richardson office, if I get a P1 and I haven't resolved it, I have to stay on that call till 7 p.m. before I could pass it off to the next theater. So people would try and avoid them because nobody wanted to be staying at the office till 7 p.m. Yeah, is yeah. that like on, on two a call? hours, one hour later than normal or how? So it's usually like I would get in at 8 a.m. Oh, so wow. there would be days that I was there from 8 to 7. Oh, that's tough. That's, yeah. that's a long day. Hmm. Yeah, it is definitely a long day. Um, and, and then another good one. I'm I'm genuinely curious. Do, does Tech have a rating system for customers? So if you have a, a customer company that calls in and they're just like really shitty to you, do you guys like have notes you take somewhere and let everybody else know? Like, hey, if you get tickets from this place, watch out for these guys or whatever. Um, not typically. So there's really depend. Again, this is all dependent on technology. There's not that many tech engineers. So if there is a company that you constantly see, like there are some just like notorious people that <laughs> from specific companies that we would know about, right? Just, just from taking cases from them previously, because sure. like on my team, we may only have like six people on queue at once. Oh, wow. I mean, okay. it, it's not that many, right? So word does travel. Um, and then depending on what kind of contract that you have, you would have HTTS, which is the higher tier TAC. Basically, you get a lot more benefits. And those are more seasoned TAC engineers. They've been working in TAC for a while. They have better customer service skills. Uh, you get like, you just get a little bit extra perks, right, for having HTTS. But there's also much, many fewer customers. So from those customers, then you really know because you're constantly working with the same people all sure. the time. Um, so you definitely would know about certain customers or certain companies that might have maybe like a lot of outsourced help, which sometimes was hard because they would just put in tickets for literally everything. Like that was their support basically uh, is just, if anything's wrong, just put in a ticket for it and have tax solve it. Mm -hmm. And so that could be frustrating because you're not working on the other end with somebody who is familiar with the systems at all. And that could be frustrating. And, and I, I heard you say it with uh, HTTTS or HTTTS. What, what does that stand for? Um, it's high touch technical support i think oh HTTS. okay you know um one we had a, a a guest on the show early on it was actually a friend of andy's who was uh hts for uh, i believe it was google and at&t mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's right yeah. I, okay i remember that now so yeah so it's, it's basically a tech engineer that's dedicated to certain companies sometimes in yeah. some technologies they will be dedicated to specific customers only mm -hmm. For server virtualization, they didn't have any dedicated engineers, oh, okay. but it was just a much smaller pool of companies. Like yeah. maybe you would really only be dealing with like 10 companies potentially. Gotcha. Uh, so, yeah, but it is someone said white glove. It is more of a white glove service where mm -hmm. like, you know, if you have regular t support with TAC, we won't sit on an upgrade or anything like that but HTTS will so if you are uncomfortable with an upgrade or something they'll sit on the call with you while you do it gotcha. but regular support doesn't grant you that right interesting right. just the oh shit something broke while I was doing this now I can call <laughs> yeah exactly right <laughs> <laughs> there's also things like they can't close your case like for regular tech, I can three strike you. So if you haven't responded to like, if let's say I email you, call you, email you again, then I can close your case if you haven't responded. I don't think they can do, they have much different rules in HTTS for how they can close your case without having a response. Okay. I see. I know that. Huh. Okay. So um, can we go back a little bit? Like how, what got you into networking? What started you out on the Cisco Netacad stuff? How did that work? Yeah. Um, so that's also kind of an interesting story. I, so I guess like when I first started working in technology, my first job was, I was 16 working at Best Buy 
And I had originally applied to be a cashier, but they said I would make like a dollar more if I worked in computers. And I was like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) I'll do that. (laughs) And, you know, I actually... I didn't really grow up with like a ton of money. Like I had a single mom. I, we didn't really have computers or internet in my house. So a lot of my experience with computers was basically just from school, like working on school computers and things like that. And so I learned a lot at Best Buy and we'd have like a lot of customers come in and a lot of people to assume that I was already in college Uh, But I wasn't at the time. I was still in high school. And so they'd ask like, oh, where are you going to college? And no one in my family had gone to college. So I didn't really have plans to go to college. I knew we didn't have the money for me to go to college. Um, But then a lot of people were like, what do you mean you're not like going to go to college? And so because it's like everyone's like, what? Like you have to go to college. Uh And I'm like, "I, I, I don't think I'm going to go to college. And I really hadn't put that much thought into it, right? So I ended up applying for University of Akron because basically they had an acceptance rate where anybody could get in because I did not have the grades. I was a notoriously bad student and it wasn't because I'm not intelligent. I just hated school. Like I hated being told what to do. I hated getting up early. I did not like teachers. Like I had a really pro I had problems with authority overall where I was just like, I don't understand why you're telling me to do this. And this doesn't make sense, you know? And so I always kind of just did not really excel in school. And so I got into Akron cause I graduated high school with a 2.1 GPA. I mean, I really did not care <laughs> about yeah. school. Um, and then So I went to Akron and I liked it so much more because I got to basically pick my major, pick what classes I was going to take, do it on my own time. And I think just having that mobility, having that power to just choose what I wanted to do, I jived a lot better with. Mm -hmm. And I had a much easier time with professors because they treat you like adults. They Mm -hmm. didn't care. I didn't have to like raise my hand and go to the bathroom, you know. And so for me, I just like that a lot better. Um, And so I did really well in college. The reason I ended up picking networking is because we had this guy that would always come in. Like, you know, you have regulars pretty much working in retail all the time. You'll, You'll meet regulars. And he was just telling, oh, you should do networking. You should do networking because you'll always have a job. And he knew like a little bit about like my home life. And I I mean, I grew up in the Rust Belt. So job security is like a really important thing that people think about a lot because that's really affected the area that I grew up in was a lot of the automotive companies moving out and a lot of people and families lost jobs and were living in poverty because there weren't high paying jobs in that area Mm -hmm. anymore. And it's gotten a lot better. Right. But still people really think about job security and they're like, if you go into networking, you'll get paid. Well, you'll always have a job. You know, the internet's not going anywhere. And so I was like, all right, cool. And at the time, the only thing I knew about networking was like the stuff that was sold in the home networking aisle (laughs) at Best Buy. So I was like, how hard can it be? You know, like whatever. Um, It was hard. (laughs) I was very confused my first networking class because I'm like, what are you talking about? Like I was overly confident going into it because I thought I knew a lot more than I did. Uh, But I got through it. I made I made it through at the other end. (laughs) That's awesome yeah cool so you basically okay so it was somebody at best buy who was a regular who was like you should get into networking that's really yeah just and somebody I was like, mentioned sure. it yeah i i had no plan like i really didn't know what i wanted to do and i i didn't think i was really interested in software development which is a lot of people think like oh do computer science and then you know do software and coding blah blah, blah. and i was just like i don't think i really care about that too much. And so networking seemed a little bit more interesting to me. And I was like, well, I don't have any other plan, so I'll just go do this. (laughs) Might as well. That's awesome. So Cisco Tech after college and then what? I, I briefly quit Cisco, um, because of creative differences. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> problems with authority perhaps no <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i basically like had applied internally for another position and 
my manager wasn't happy because two people on the tag team, which we were already a little bit understaffed, but the tag teams are chronically understaffed. Um, he was not happy about losing two people and there was like some riffraff. And then I ended up just like quitting because I was like, you know what? I... And I don't blame this on Cisco as a whole. Like specifically, I think I had more of a problem with this manager who always put himself over the people, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I just was like, well, if you don't support like me and my growth, because I'm so I was so young, you know, so I was like, this is so early in my career. Like this is a time where I need to be like growing and moving and expanding. And so I was just like, all right. So I started applying for another jobs and I quit in two weeks. And so I left, worked for this other company for a little bit and basically did data center design. I helped with like a nexus to ACI migration and some other things. And I wasn't there very long because Cisco reached back out to me and wanted me to work on the other team that I originally applied for. And I was like, all right, cool. And then I went back. So nice. <laughs> okay. It worked out. So what was yeah, this other team? Uh, so I did like customer success for a little bit and I was the technical lead for that on compute for the like centers America. It's all like the one thing that drives me nuts. I love Cisco, you know, like I would definitely recommend other people work there. But there's so much corporate jargon <laughs> that I'm just like, none. all of this is so meaningless to me. Like it's I don't I don't care about any of these words. Like I don't I right. feel like I shouldn't need a dictionary for these like made up corporate terms. Right. But anyway, that's like a whole other soapbox of mine. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was on customer success, basically helping customers when they would have issues with their new products, either migrating into their systems or whatever. I would come in, address kind of what barriers they were having or what problems and then a lot of times it's just kind of more of an educational gap where it's like I we're completely new to ACI I have no idea what it is you like go in and talk to them about ACI make them a little bit more comfortable with their purchase and product so that they're happy about it right um but then I got bored of that really quickly because <laughs> <laughs> I was like it wasn't hands-on enough for me and it was a good job after like the burnout from TAC to kind of transition to there. It was a diff much different pace. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, all right, now I need to move on again. I usually get the the bug like a year after I start a position where I'm like, I need to be doing something more right. than that. Because I'm like, all right, I learned everything. Like now what? <laughs> and they're like, nothing. This is all you do. And I'm like, I don't like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Like, I need more. Cool. Give me more. That's good, yeah. though. I mean, you're interested in learning and you're hungry. I think that's good, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, so was the yeah. customer success the most recent position? And then you said now you're you're currently unemployed? Yeah. So I quit. So, I, I mean, obviously, we talked a little bit about my TikTok. And since starting that, I've had a number of offers. And a lot of the offers are obviously, like, operations, production, network engineer. Sometimes it was like network security because I do a lot of security focused mm -hmm. videos. Um, and I wasn't sure that's what I wanted to do again. And I kind of got a lot more into security. So I um, took a job at Black Hills Information Security and I will be doing offensive security for them. All right. Wow. Congratulations. That sounds nice. fun. Thank you. So that, yeah. so I'm you, doing that and content, which is great. Oh my God. <laughs> so you, you've busy. accepted an offer and you're just waiting it out till your start date now? Yeah. I wanted to take some time off Yeah, yeah. Um, and just not do anything for a minute. And I was like, Hey, you know, when I accept the offer with them, I was just like, Hey, I just want to take a few weeks before starting. He was like, totally, you know, the owner, his name's John Strand. He's awesome. Um, but I was like, I just need a few weeks. And he's like, cool and i was like cool <laughs> so <laughs> now i am hanging out riding my bike keep watching bridgerton right now so <laughs> yeah. wait do they have a new season out Let's talk about yeah season two's out crap. i gotta i gotta do that too <laughs> anyway no that's great yeah. recharging is so important I, I feel like everybody when changing jobs needs at least like a couple of weeks um it would seem unusual not to do that right yeah, I mean, I understand financially and like I'm paying for Cobra, sure. which is like ugh, Ooh, um, yeah. not great, but 
for me, like, luckily, I'm in the position where I can take time off and not really worry about the money so much, um, which is great, especially because, like, with TikTok, I can do sponsorships and make decent money doing that. And so the only reason I kind of need or would want a full time 40 hour a week job is one, it helps make TikTok content because Mm -hmm. I get a lot of inspiration from my job and then incorporate that into videos. But then two, like health insurance in the US is like a scam, (laughs) a whole other soapbox, but like just paying for that, right? (laughs) When you're a contractor or solo, it's so much more expensive and I have an autoimmune disease. So I'm like, I can't not have insurance. Oh, sure. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but luckily with Cobra and then like my TikTok um, income, that helps a lot. So with security, so you sort of, I guess maybe we glossed over a little bit how you got into security. You said you did the security plus, was that sort of your first like introduction to that world? So my undergrad was um, a concentration on networking and information security. So I did a lot of security work in college. And then right now I am in grad school uh, for data center systems engineering. And there's a lot of security in that as well. So yeah, I did the security plus, but I do, like I said, I do a lot of security content on TikTok and that's mainly just driven by interest. And from there I was able to get offers based off of like my content and my previous background. Wow, that's awesome. So you're in grad school right now too. So you're making content. You're about to have like a, what, 40 hour week job and you're in grad school. Like that's, that's wild. Yeah, I took some time off grad school because, um, so I have ulcerative colitis and for the last year I've been really struggling with it. Um, And I, it it did get really hard for me to kind of juggle everything. And I was like, took time off to just kind of focus on my health. And luckily now I am feeling a little bit better. And I'm kind of like, you know, I get stir crazy so easily where I'm just like, I need to take things on. I need to like keep myself busy. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I don't know. That's just how I've always been. awesome though wow good for you so thanks you have a lot going on and and so i'm wondering do you have any strategies that you use to to kind of balance and keep track of all the different things you have it's just chaos (laughs) (laughs) it is i mean i have like my outlook calendar (laughs) and, and i do have to uh I have to be careful with taking on things. So there's a lot, I mean, especially with my social media presence, I get a ton of DMs. And so that can be kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then also trying to keep up with content. It's not easy. Like, and that, so like, you know, I haven't been making as much content lately either. Um, But, you know, that's going to change soon. I'm ramping stuff back up. But yeah, I don't. I, it really, like I said, it's chaos. I'll put stuff on my calendar. Some some engagements I do have to kind of decline just because I will burn myself out if I accept everything that comes my way. But for the most part, it's been okay. <laughs> yeah. do, do you kind of plan out or pre, like give like a calendar of content uh, in advance or do you just kind of like something new topic is like hot right now? Okay, let's go make a video on that. Yeah, the latter. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll write down so, like topics in case I kind of come. Sometimes you just can get exhausted constantly thinking about content and then sure. also thinking about content that's going to fit into 60 seconds. Right. So yeah. that's wow. a whole <laughs> yep, piece. That's like a whole other piece where it's like, yeah, I can get make a YouTube video for as long as I want. TikTok, I need to get everything out in 60 seconds. And so creating that can be a little bit more difficult. Um, but so yeah, sometimes I'll write down stuff and like, oh, maybe I'll return to that later and I'll have like a little backlog of topics. Most of the content that I make is just like fired off. I'll just make the video and send it out, send it on its way and let the algorithm do whatever it's going to do. <laughs> One of the things that I admire about you with your content, whether it's like I've, I'm more active on Twitter, so I see the Twitter stuff more, but I know like with TikTok too, you'll occasionally make content specifically just to piss people off who are like usually sexist men or just like people who are 
being idiots in your comments a lot, um, which I personally really appreciate because that's <laughs> that's always fun, right? Um, and how yeah. I'm I'm curious, like how often you have to be inspired to do that, right? And by that I mean like how often are you like just just want to strangle somebody <laughs> in your DMs or your comments? It used to be a lot more frequent when I first started doing content. So the thing Uh. is, is like as a woman, you know, I mean, in general, when you make yourself a presence on the internet, you're going to get mean comments. There's trolls. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, obviously I know I'm going to get some comments pointed at me being a woman or me. People think I'm a lot younger than I am. So they think I'm like some either in college or like high school. And so I would get so many comments about like, not knowing anything about networking and all this stuff. And at the time, I was very private about where I was working, right? And so most of the time, I wanted to be like, you moron. Like, I'm literally an engineer at Cisco. (laughs) Like, I think... Because people would be like, why don't you go get a CCNA and then come talk (laughs) about these topics? And I'm like, first of all, I have two. Second of all, I'm a literal (laughs) technical lead... At Cisco. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I didn't say that, right? Because I just wanted to leave them out of it. And not and, and, and not only that, like, I don't feel like I should need to bring that up mm-hmm. and use yeah. that as part of my credibility as to why I would be good at networking or whatever, right? So I used to get a lot more frustrated by it. But now I just like like trolling people back and that's probably just because I'm like a troll myself (laughs) and I like would rather just use it for content because it's funny right and it's like okay it is very you're gonna come here and I'm gonna make you look stupid and everybody's gonna laugh and then I'm gonna get followers (laughs) (laughs) you know what I mean and it sounds bad right but it's like don't don't fire shots if you're not ready to, right. <laughs> to take some heat back. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I can say I relate to the impulse for sure. <laughs> That's part of it. Yeah. And yeah. I walk a tight rope because a lot of times I wish my account was anonymous so I could really say how I'm feeling. And there is a point where it's like, I'm going to get myself blacklisted from this industry <laughs> if I like really say <laughs> what I want to you, say. You've mentioned so, like people contacting your work, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. And, oh and like gosh. finding out who you are, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. So that has happened. I had like, I don't know, I call him a stalker and I think it was multiple people who and this happens kind of frequently but they'll like target somebody and try and dox them and my theory behind it and it's kind of somewhat supported is that they're like basically kids from like skid hacker forums and they are trying to like basically show off their hacking skills or get involved with certain groups or whatever by like targeting higher profile people in in tech or Mm -hmm. whatever. I don't really care that much. But so they were trying to get me fired from my job and they would, I mean, I mean, I'm not like hundreds of emails about me. They would put, they would send every TikTok that I posted to my work and it would be stu- it would be funny because I would be talking about a security topic that would literally be on a Cisco certification, and they're like, "She's teaching people how to hack and do illegal <laughs> activities," and I'm like, "These are literal concepts on certifications that's published by Cisco." Super weak. So why would they care that I'm talking about those concepts and teaching people? Do you about know, them? like, had you shared where you worked? Did they find out where you worked? They just found my LinkedIn, which honestly wasn't super hard because it was up. So if you would search Serena Cisco on Google, I was the first thing that came up because I have I have I don't know if it's still up. It probably still is. But a profile page of me on Cisco's website. Okay. Mm -hmm. so it really wasn't too difficult. Like it was kind of an 
open secret, but the main reason I didn't associate was because I wanted to say whatever I wanted on my account without violating like company social media policies Mm -hmm. by associating myself with them. So as long as I wasn't like actively being like, I'm a Cisco employee and F you, (laughs) (laughs) then it's fine. Right. And so, um, I mean, obviously there are some things that if you get very extreme that it's not going to go over well. And right. I'm not that type of person, though. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the real stuff, I'm like, mm, no. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, I mean, they just kept doing that. They were, like, threatening to go to my house. But, the like, they were... And this is how I knew they were, like, kids because they just were not that intelligent. <laughs> and, like, they found an old voter record in Ohio, which had an address that I hadn't lived in in 10 years, like in 10 years. And you could see like on Zillow, if you were to look up that address when that house was sold. So they're like, we're going to come to your parents' house and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, listen, if you show up to my mom's house unannounced, I don't even do that. (laughs) She's crazy. (laughs) I don't, I have to warn my mom before I go to her house or else I'm not, it's not going to be a good time for me. You know what I mean? But so I was just like, anyway, my whole, I was like, my bio literally says that I live in Dallas, Texas. You are giving me an Ohio address. That's so funny. (laughs) So you're obviously not that intelligent. <laughs> so was, was wow. the goal, and I'm sorry I keep focusing on this. I just think it's interesting. Like, was the goal to intimidate you in general or just like that doesn't seem that part right there doesn't seem focused on like getting you fired. So were they it sounds like they were just straight up harassing you to make you yeah. crazy or something, you know? So I think like the first things that they said to me was like, send me a thousand Bitcoin or I'll dox your address and like sent me the address. And I was like, post it. (laughs) I was like, post the address. And they did. And I was like, all right, cool. And so I kind of thought like that would be the end of it just because I was like, I don't care. Like, Sorry for whoever bought the house. <laughs> like, if you really do go there. Um, but I was like, I I don't whatever. Um, but then it was like them calling my work. And like, I don't know if it's because I was trolling them back that they kind of like got more personal with it where they were like, all right, then like, screw you. Like, I'll show you or whatever, because I was just not giving in to like anything that they were trying to say or do or whatever. And I was trolling them back because I was like, this is hilarious. To me. <laughs> like, this is funny to me. Like, I don't care. And then they would just say stuff that I knew was like, they were like, we have photos of you. And I was like, are they good ones? Like, <laughs> you know, like, response. do I look good? Share like, them. which one? <laughs> like, you know? And not only that, I was like, if you did have photos of me, I think it would be very easy for you to prove that. Um, and obviously they didn't and they don't and they were just trying to like bluff, you know, and I'm just I call people out on their bluffs like you're not going to intimidate me or scare me. I don't mm-hmm. really care. Um, I mean, them calling my work was super annoying. Like that yeah. part irritated me because I was like, here, there's a lot of things like you want to harass me on Twitter or social media. You want to say your mean comments, whatever. But you trying to mess with my income and my health insurance. And at the time, like I said, I was very sick at the time. So I was like very reliant on the health insurance that I was getting through my employer. And if that would have gotten taken away, that would have been like very detrimental to me. Mm-hmm. And so I was just kind of like, that's what irritated me at that point. And so I got their social media account subpoenaed <laughs> <laughs> because I'm that person <laughs> and I will be annoying and I will find you and... That was taken care of. So (laughs) (laughs) nice. Wow. (laughs) That's awesome. No mercy. No mercy. None. (laughs) Destroy the trolls. The the thing with the trolls, though, is they're going to be like, wow, like you're not very mature. And I'm like, I'm not. (laughs) <laughs> like because they really expect you to be the bigger person and I won't be <laughs> so like and I mean but that's it is what it is like I 
I'll troll you back. Like, I'll figure it <laughs> out. I'll find a way. Like, I'm very dedicated and I'm intelligent. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it worked out. That's over. And, you know, I get mean comments here and there. I think my original point was that when I started doing content, I was surprised by the number of comments that I would get. Like, it was like I knew I would get them. And it was just like, I had no idea it would be so many because mm, wow. my videos would get hundreds of thousands of views. And that's a lot of eyes. And that's a lot of people all over the world, right? So people have opinions about women in different countries that are different than we do in America. And there are also jerks here that have opinions about women and working and you know, being called a diversity hire or like whatever. And fun. the thing is, is like, I knew that's not true. So like, why do I care if this user 6573 blah, 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 whatever, who's too scared to even show their face? Like, all right, like I'm still getting my paycheck at the end of the day. So <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess who's really winning here? <laughs> I love that but, attitude. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Seriously. Yeah. Well, I think it's safe to say that you've put like tech and networking and some security things like in front of a lot of people who may not have actually been exposed to that. Right. Like, um, I feel like there, the more women who make like tech related content, the better. Um, even if it's just like a, you know, 30 second video of, of like, I don't know what, see, I don't even, I can't even think of anything like what a router is, right? <laughs> like, you know, even if it's just like a simple thing. And I, I love that TikTok's platform like allows for digesting that really easily. Um, and I love that you're doing that because it's just, I don't know, the more exposure for women in tech, the better. Yeah. I just, my thing is like, I don't want people to see there, I don't know if you saw on Twitter the ad and it was like a woman in a tank top and it yep, was like saw it. cybersecurity work from home. And like I was shocked by the comments because honestly, it's an ad that I if I would have scrolled right past and not thought of twice. Yeah. Right. I honestly would have just been like whatever and gone about my day. But somebody screenshotted this ad and it was just like a woman in a tank top working at her computer and it was just like a like work from home, try cybersecurity, blah blah blah. And people were like, "Oh, like you they have to use like, I don't know. I'm sorry if you need a sense of the word boobs, right? For <laughs> like for you to get people interested." And it's just like this is it's just a woman who biologically has boobs like she's not she can't just leave them at home yeah i'm looking at it i'm looking at it again right now and she's literally it's just a stock photo of a woman in a tank top sitting like in her living room on her laptop and she's smiling it, it's, for me it's the most generic like I, I, yeah. I don't and so like the comments were like yeah this is a really distasteful ad and i was like what yeah it's, it's not <laughs> like, it's what? not like revealing like it's not it's just like a normal looking lady in it yeah it's just like a stock photo that the the woman probably took that and didn't even know it would be used in that ad right and so (laughs) i just was like so surprised but thing is is like i want to get to the point in tech where like people just aren't surprised that a woman shows up to fix your issue or something like that or you answer the phone and you have a tack call because this would happen to me all the time like there was one time i got on a call and it's it was a p1 and this thing had been going on for hours. And it was the ACI team did a collab with UCS because they didn't, they still couldn't really figure out where this problem was coming from. And there was about a hundred people on this call when I joined. Okay. It was like all hands on deck. And the entire com- this per- entire company was on the call. And so I joined the call and the customer's talking to the other engineer. And so I was just like, okay, I'll just wait. I don't want to interrupt because sometimes I can get on and hear what they're saying and gather some information and it's useful for me, whatever. And so he goes, where is this engineer? Where is he? When is he joining? Like just saying stuff like that, which is, I don't really care too much, whatever. So I 
unmuted myself and I was like, hi, like I'm Serena. I'm your tech engineer. And there was a lot of people on the call who aren't muted. And you can just hear like everybody break out in laughter because this guy had said he, him so many times. And then I answered with my voice. Right. And they were like, and the guy was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I didn't know you're on the call. Like, and he felt really bad. And the kind of interesting thing was he was kind of heated talking to the other engineer, but that almost reset him. And so he calmed down a lot at that point to talk to me and tell me what the issue was. It was fine. But the thing is, I want to get to the point where like people aren't surprised yeah. that they see a woman and that they don't think about it. Like it doesn't need to be thought about. It doesn't need to be a topic for me. It's just like, like you should be able to see an ad talking about cybersecurity that involves a woman mm -hmm. and you're not like offended by it mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. she has a body yeah. you know so yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh that was fun to read man that whole thing was just sometimes i read stuff on twitter and i i don't know i'm still surprised which is surprising but yeah sometimes i read stuff and i'm just like can you explain why you think this ad is offensive or distasteful and they won't. And that's the other thing, too. Like, I ask a lot of people, I'm like, what, like, what do you think is distasteful about this ad? But they wouldn't say it. Right. But we know the they answer. Wouldn't, yeah, they, they wouldn't say it. And so that's how I'm like, mm, OK, <laughs> I see. <laughs> say the quiet part out loud already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very frustrating. Yeah. yeah, I I yeah. I don't know. All I can do is agree with you at this point. Like, I don't even have anything <laughs> insightful to say because it, it gets really, really old. <laughs> We don't, it have, does. we don't have to just it's, continue talking about this, but like it's it gets really, really old sometimes Going to see that shit on Twitter and everywhere. Yeah. It'll be like a great day when this isn't a topic. I mean, yeah, it, right. it unfortunately has to be talked about mm -hmm. right now. But when you get to the point where nobody cares and as many people, yeah. as so many people be like, nobody does care. I, I can tell you a lot of people care because they're in my comment section very loudly telling me that they care. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And like, you know, I, I've never been in it. I haven't yet been in a tech job that like there were anywhere close to the number of women as there were men. Um, it's just, I don't know. I've heard some like mythical stories about software engineering and sometimes that can be like more, you know, there can be more women sometimes in that field, but I haven't seen it myself and I'm just waiting for the day because I think in an environment where there are, there is like a much more equal, just like distribution of women and men, whoever, like, you know, we, we just have a better environment in general and people stop like caring about something so arbitrary and silly as like what your gender is when you're just trying to do a job right yeah the one thing that i liked about tack was no, like as far as my coworkers went like nobody cared they're like can you take a case okay like, <laughs> because us. there's so many cases and everyone's <laughs> so busy it's like I don't care. Like, I truly, if it's a five-year-old that can talk to a customer, like, take the case, <laughs> you know? And so that was, like, a good part. And, I mean, we just vibed really well on that team together. Of course, you do get customers, which, you know, in the professional world, it's very different than online because people feel a lot more comfortable saying how they truly feel behind a screen under mm. an anonymous username or whatever. A lot of times it's not as anonymous that, they think it is and I find them and because I'm like I want to know who this is like I want to put a face to a name right so I'll end up tracking them down and finding their LinkedIn's and people are like oh these are just like little kids it's not like every person that I've really found aside from maybe a handful are men who work in a lot of times it's been software developers to be honest it's not even people that work in networking <laughs> most of the time it hasn't because Weird. they're trying to correct me or whatever and someone who works in networking will know what i'm saying is valid versus a software engineer who's like oh this doesn't i took one net engineering network engineering course in college and now i know more than you about it and it's like okay i like wait <laughs> sure. what is your like twitter banner it's is that a comment from someone? Go try a layer for UDP, TCP, and the OSI stacks. No, that's a C, like that's a CSI, uh, a CSI quote. Basically, it's just like the cat closed captioning okay. for a CSI okay. episode. 
And I think on YouTube, you can look up just like bad CSI technology takes. There's like one oh, where they're great. both like typing on the keyboard <laughs> like at the same time. It's just, I love just some it. Other stuff. It sounds like a threat. It sounds like someone's threatening you. Go try it there for <laughs> UDP, TCP, and the OSI stacks. Yeah. Man, that's I hilarious. mean, that's that's like one thing I like to do. Like, I like mm. to joke around. I like to be satirical and like very sarcastic. And sometimes like a lot of people miss that sarcasm and they think I'm an idiot, which kind of becomes fun for me. Like the raid video I posted became very oh, controversial. That's right. that's right. I saw that. So for people who haven't seen the video, I posted a video and it was a TikTok trend where it would be like a girl, oh gosh, I'm trying to like remember some of the, oh, it was, okay. So one of them was like a, a guy and he was like, when my girlfriend says she needs new foundation, but her house is just fine. <laughs> and then the background music is a song where it just says, you look so dumb right now. And so it was just like a sarcastic joke, right? So mine that I posted was when they say you need a back backup, but you have raid. <laughs> and so this is like an old joke. Like it's not like I didn't make this up myself, you know, as much as I think I'm hilarious. Like I that's not like my joke. It's a very <laughs> old joke. Um, and everybody in the comments thought I was being like serious and it got posted in like Facebook groups where people were like, she's so dumb and just like all this other stuff. And here's the, the kicker, because I knew people would miss it. I knew people would miss the joke. So in the caption, I literally wrote, this is a joke. <laughs> like I put it in the caption and people still missed it. And of course it got like reposted and all this stuff. So like, I would troll them in the comments when people thought I was serious because it's like, oh, like you say that till you have a fire in your data center. And I was yeah, like, awesome. my data center doesn't have any fires. <laughs> like just like just ridiculous. And then I would like repost those comments on Twitter because they were just like funny. And yeah, that was a whole thing. Oh that was very gosh. controversial. So much entertainment <laughs> just from that. I mean, the return on investment for you must have been so good. I know. I was like, so, and that's honestly how I ended up gaining a lot of my Twitter followers was like posting just ridiculous stuff that I, comments and different things that I got on TikTok and reposting it on Twitter. Cause I'm like, y'all see this? <laughs> like, so do you think a lot of those followers is, came from like people who got the joke as it were or people who didn't get the joke and wanted to like hate follow because <laughs> so I've definitely seen that happen no I think most of the people in my experience Twitter as far as like my technical stuff has like is m way less toxic than TikTok by far Good. and I think it's maybe because Twitter has typically an older crowd. Um, a lot more people are professional on there because they are using actual real accounts with their faces attached and maybe their company that they work in or they are a professional that's been working there for a long time um, versus sometimes you get it a little bit different on TikTok. I don't know. It's, it's a different vibe. Um, but Twitter has typically been a lot more welcoming to me than TikTok has been. It's good to hear. But it sounds yeah. like you're handling like the trolls and all the silliness very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an ever evolving process, right? I mean, I used to get upset, kind of. And then I was like, it's really not that surprising. I mean, it gets to a point where you get so many comments that you're just like, okay, whatever. Like, I've heard the same thing like 20 million times. You must get so much Like, engagement. come up with new jokes. Yeah, like, you, you probably <laughs> yeah. don't even have time to read most of the stuff that people say, I'm guessing. So. Yeah, sometimes when videos... It, the 100,000 view mark is where things like really hit the fan because below that, it's mainly people that are familiar with my content and are familiar with me. But then after 100,000, it's a lot of people who might be seeing me for the very first time. They have no idea who I am. They don't know any of my previous content, any of my background. They have not been following me. And so they might just be like, who the heck is this? Like, what is, I don't understand. Why is this on my For You page this or whatever? Says, right, is the so, backup. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, like, and that—that that was. Poof. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be making that joke again. <laughs> Just you should make it once a year, you know, and see how far you can get this joke. 
for like yeah. 10 years in a row and you'll, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it gets really rough. So some of my videos or different things have been reposted on 4chan. Oh, I'm and sorry. And so when that happens, it really goes downhill quickly. <sighs> but I don't know. Again, like it doesn't bother me too much. I know some women who have basically alerts from programs that will tell them when their name pops up on 4chan on certain boards. And oh. I was like, I don't want to know. Honestly, they can say whatever they want. I, I just don't want to see it. I can see <laughs> like, that being super draining, right? Like to know everything everyone is saying about you, or at least in, in some of the most toxic, toxic places on the internet. I can. Yeah. I, can I mean, understand. I don't need to know. The only thing that I need to know is like what is happening in my life. And I know myself better than anybody else knows me. So I'm not going to let some greasy nerd on 4chan <laughs> get me down. <laughs> you know, it's like whatever. People are going to say things. And it's it's not going away either, right? Like I'm going to continue to make content and that's going to continue to be a problem. So it's just like might as well let it go now mm-hmm. or stop making content. There's There's no... In between, they're not going to stop being mean. I'm not going to stop getting mean comments. The only thing that I could do is stop making content. And like, I'm not going to do that. So it's a great, healthy attitude, I think. I think we can all aspire <laughs> to that. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, your- I'm in therapy. So <laughs> <laughs> not to brag, but I'm in therapy. Not to brag, but. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's very healthy. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Well, um, I would like to say thank you to the Patreons for asking so many wonderful questions this evening. If you're interested in joining our Patreon program, you can go to patreon.com forward slash art of net Serena, what's your most popular video on TikTok? Um, that's a good question. I had a, a video on basically talks about hacker one and bug bounties that did really well because it was like, Hey, you find bugs, you could get like $20,000. So everyone's like, how do I do that? Um, so probably that one might be, but I also did some videos with hack five on like Wi-Fi pineapple that did really well. So I'm not quite oh. sure which one's the best Very cool. or has the most views or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you have any advice to women considering a career in tech? Yeah, do it. kick kick ass and just you know like really figure out what you want to do uh there's so many avenues and paths and technologies and if you don't like something stop doing it and try something new you know don't get stuck in something that you don't like because you feel like you have to to do it or you're like a failure there's you you can pick up and try a ton of different things and not like it and set it down and, and not feel bad you know, I kind of had a complex when I was in college where I didn't want to fail because I was the only woman in the class. And I didn't want that to be like a representation of all women just because I had a failure. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't want to be like, oh, look, she couldn't do it. So now all women can do that. Like, don't put that kind of pressure on yourself, because at right. the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I mean, I talked to like two people I went to college with that were in my courses. <laughs> so like, <laughs> None of it really matters. Um, and, you know. I think another thing, there's a lot of pressure on women to have credentials like certifications and degrees because you feel like this is a way to show that you are valid and that you do have the knowledge. And it's like some type of like physical proof you can show somebody. Mm -hmm. And that feeling's never going to go away. I mean, I was an engineer at Cisco and I had people telling me that I didn't know what I was talking about. So... You could get a CCIE and you're still going to have those comments. So don't stress yourself out by trying to get all these credentials because I've, I did that and I still get all those comments. So (laughs) it doesn't really matter. Just do what you want to do and don't let all these other people put pressure on you. That's probably like my biggest advice. I love advice. That's Mm -hmm. that's great advice. Mm -hmm. Um, for any of our listeners that uh, don't follow you, uh, where can people follow you and your your various social media accounts? So I am on TikTok as She Networks. Mm-hmm. I am on Twitter as Not She Networks because <laughs> She Networks was taken. So <laughs> I'm not She Networks there. Um, and then I'm also on YouTube as She Networks as well. I don't have any videos yet, but I am going to be starting 
to post more frequently here soon and do some longer form content. So if you want to be an early subscriber to my YouTube channel, it's very much appreciated. And those are probably like my main, my main platforms. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll put a link to all of those in the show notes so you can uh, subscribe early or uh, jump on and follow her in her various uh, places. Serena, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Is there any questions that we should have asked you that we didn't get a chance to before we close out? No, I think this has been great and the conversations have been awesome. And thank you for the invitation to be on your podcast. Thank you for being Thank you here. so much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week on another episode of the Art of Network Engineering podcast. Hey y'all, this is Lexi. If you vibe with what you heard us talking about today, we'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcatcher. Also, go ahead and hit that bell icon to make sure you're notified of all our future episodes right when they come out. If you want to hear what we're talking about when we're not on the podcast, you can totally follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Art of NetEng. That's Art of N-E-T-E-N-G. You can also find a bunch more info about us and the podcast at artofnetworkengineering.com. Thanks for listening.